I believe it is time to ready the battle. Uh, oh my god. Oh my <laughs> god, guys. I'm so sorry. Welcome back to PJ Bit. My name is James, and apparently we have Korg and Alfred put together as oh, that's one the person. Music. Yeah, actually, this reminds me. The music reminds me of Amnesia right away. Like the the, the sound on the main menu. We are playing Dagon. It's a free game on Steam. It is uh, much more of a story-based game. Um, we don't really know what we're in for. We've we have both. I'm gonna say yeah. We've both been a fan of H.P. Lovecraft for a while. I would like yeah. to read more of his stuff, though. I'm not gonna lie. We have a beautiful. Ugh, beautiful a beautiful big collection that we have of like a stories with annotations and oh, oh yeah, yeah exactly 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 so anyways the long the point is is that we we have been fascinated with hp lovecraft before and uh we've mentioned on the channel we've played sinking city which is a beautifully crafted detective game and it really explores hp lovecraft's uh writing material really really well um, though it doesn't tend to have the best reviews, that game, but seriously, if you like, if you're going to like this, you will yep. like that. Um, so I'm really excited about this. Uh, I, I, uh, let's re-listen to, so I listen to audiobooks. I re-listened to Dagon a couple times. Peyton's re read through it too. Yeah. Uh, Dagon, if you don't know, is a story written by H.P. Lovecraft, the horror writer. Uh, so, and it's a very famous one. So we're going to see what this game is. If it's just the story of Dagon, I think the idea is they're going to go through a bit more... Uh, like information about H.P. Lovecraft himself and uh, you know how he grew up and how he came to writing these stories and that's the idea right Peyton? Yeah those are like little easter eggs that you can collect. I, I yeah. don't know. I, I don't just, know idea. It's in our library and I was like spooky times. But I found on, it. I'm sorry. <laughs> on the ocean. Dude, the ocean is the scariest place ever. Dagon is a faithful interactive ad adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's work, focused on story and atmosphere. You will not find difficult choices, action sequences, or inventory management here. And movement is limited to progress, uh, progressing through locations along with the plot. Okay. Okay, so it's a it's I'm a I'm writing this story. under an appreciable mental strain, since by tonight I shall be no more. Oh. Oh, is it the beginning of the actual story? Yeah. Once, one fact. second. I'm sorry. I'm gonna, we're going to be nerds about this one. Fact check. Just trying to find page three, guys. Okay, so while he's finding page three, during the game, you will encounter interactive elements. Some of the elements uh, will allow you to continue your journey. Others reveal interesting facts about the original short story, its historical background, and the author. So, yeah, so there is little Easter eggs about H.P. Lovecraft himself. Dude, it is the intro. I am writing this under an... Uh, appreciable mental strain since my tonight I shall be no more. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I love this. So this is literally going to be the story yeah. and they're just painting the story with the game. That's cool. I like this. So you gotta the window. Okay, oh. so, that, so that means you can progress, but like, is there shit that we can? Oh, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this already. And you can't move, so it, it is very limited. Okay, so we're going to progress. Penniless and at the end of my supply of the drug which alone makes life endurable. I can bear the torture no longer, and shall cast myself from this garret window into the squalid street below. Yep, so this is a suicide note, right? That was Do the not idea, think yeah. from my slavery to morphine that I am a weakling or a degenerate. Cool. This when you have read these hastily scrawled pages, you may guess, though never fully realize why it is that I must have forgetfulness or death. The horrors this man has seen. What horrors have you seen, sir? <laughs> I, okay. love, I love HP Lovecraft stuff. I love the atmosphere and the and the storytelling in this game. Ooh. Morphine entered into use in the 19th century and was routinely administered to treat yeah. severe pain during the American Civil War, 1861-865, and World War I, 1914 and 1918. It was also sold without restrictions until 1914, yikes. Morphine became more popular after the invention of the hypodermic syringe yeah. around 1854. Frederick Surturner, who first isolated the substance, originally named it Morpheum 
after Morpheus. Oh, the red pill or the blue pill? <laughs> <laughs> the Greek god associated with the dreams. I didn't know that. You didn't Morpheus oh, was yeah. a, is a Greek god associated with dreams? Oh my god, guys. I'm a huge fan of the Matrix, so it's like, ah, uh, okay. At the time when Dagon was published, morphine abuse, known as soldier's disease, already posed a big problem in the United States. Okay, I'm actually already liking this. I know this game, to most of you, has probably already seemed very slow, but I love how they're walking you through the story and giving you some historical background to really what's going on here and where everything's coming from. Because this works are studied like crazy. Yeah. This is cool. Okay, all right, keep going, it's, keep going. It's like a guide Ooh. for better understanding the story. So if like, yeah. you ever have to write a paper about it. If you've ever been cool. interested in, uh, in H.P. Lovecraft and just knowing more about the writer, this is a great game to play. Even though it's not too much of a regular video game. It was in one of the most open and least frequented parts of the broad Pacific that the packet of which I was supercargo fell a victim to the German Sea Raider. Yeah, it was World War One when this happened. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm just seeing if there's anything else. The sky is really pretty, weirdly enough. So you're on a boat right now, and we're getting attacked right now. The Great War was then at its very beginning, and the ocean forces of the Hun had not completely sunk to their later degradation. The Hun in this case, wasn't it to talk about Germany? It, it was like, it was like a propaganda. Yeah. Because it was like relating the Germans to another another war against the Chinese or something. Yeah. I, I, so I, it's like a propaganda piece that's just yeah. part of the history of it. So that our vessel was made a legitimate prize whilst we of her crew were treated with all the fairness and consideration due us as naval prisoners. Yeah. The Huns. Here the Huns. we go. Oh my god, they're gonna explain it. The Huns were Central Asian nomads who established a dominion in Europe. Uh, this reminds me of uh, Mulan. Is that what that was about? Yeah, it yeah. was. They yeah. The Roman Empire in the 5th century, um, and they were known as brutal, deadly warriors and masters of quick raids, who also developed powerful composite ba bows, bows. Uh, bows, wow, I can't read today, <laughs> lassos, and early siege weapons. During World War One, the British used the word Hun as a synonym for Germans, see? It's like yeah. A, it was just training it like that, in order to emphasize a brutality. However, the term originated when the German Empire Wilhelm gave a speech. Did I say that right? I think it's Wilhelm. Wilhelm, sorry. Gave a speech to his troops on 20th century July 1900 before they embarked to China. Should you encounter the enemy, he will be defeated. No quarter will be given. Prisoners will not be taken. Whoever falls into your hands is, is forfeited. Just as a thousand years ago, the Huns under their king Attila made a name for themselves. One that even today makes them seem mighty in history and legend. And may the name German be affirmed, affirmed by you in such a way in China that no Chinese will ever again dare to cross cross-eyed at German. The refusal to take prisoners was a clear breach of the laws and customs of war adopted during the first Hague Intervention, 1899. Yeah, so they weren't going to take any prisoners, and that was important to the story. Yeah. But yeah, this is a reference to the German U-boats. So liberal, indeed, was the discipline of our captors that five days after we were taken, I managed to escape alone in a small boat with water and provisions for a good length of time. This is me on my boat. So you're getting oh, up, yeah, Eric. Okay. So you're escaping the the warship you were on. Yeah. Because I think he, he was an officer, right? This character that we are. I, think I he believe was a, so, yeah. He was like some kind of war officer. They got attacked by the Germans. Yeah. So he's escaping in the boat because he wanted to become a prisoner. When I finally found myself adrift and free, I had but little idea of my surroundings. Oh, this is going to be cool, eh? I'm excited to see what they do here. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, look at the moonlight. That's pretty. That's ac This is actually really pretty. Never a competent navigator. I could only guess vaguely by the sun and stars that I was somewhat south of the equator. This is kind of cool because this game is forcing you to just don't, you're not doing any activities, you're just experiencing the ambience and listening yeah. to the but words the of the story. Longitude, I knew nothing, and no island or coastline was in sight. Mm -hmm. That is really pretty, eh? Wow. 
little lantern. Yeah, bring him a pack pack. Very peaceful, eh? Yeah. Yet, yet the horror of the oceans are still to come. The weather yeah. kept fair, and for uncounted days I drifted aimlessly beneath the scorching sun, waiting either for some passing ship or to be cast on the shores of some habitable land. Yep. So just drifting aimlessly. Like your food. Your drink. Drink, yeah. Your drink and food. He drinks on. But neither ship nor land appeared, and I began to despair in my solitude upon the heaving vastness of unbroken So this blue. is kind of interesting because the character's in a very particular situation where he doesn't have much left. Like, you're going to go mad in this situation, right? Yeah. And that's what H.P. Lovecraft really builds his writing on. whilst I slept. Yeah. He builds his writing on this a lot. Its details I shall never know. For my slumber, though troubled and dream-infested, was continuous. <laughs> okay, so this is what he dreamed of. How they depict it. When at last I awoke, it was to discover myself half sucked into a slimy expanse of hellish black mire, which extended about me in monotonous the, undulations uh, as yeah, far as I could see. Stranding. Yeah, so, okay, I gotta say this before uh, Peyton moves yeah. along. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. Um, this, like, so, stop me if you need to. When we were reading, um, oh, by the way, hello, we're playing this game for Halloween. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't mention that. Woo! <laughs> because the horror writer, yeah, a good horror writer. Uh, when we were rereading Dagon, I think I was doing, I was listening to the audiobooks and Peyton was reading the books. We kind of looked at each other like, this is literally Death Stranding. Like, this is yeah. literally where Death Stranding got their idea. Like, a hundred percent. Like, this is literally what the it is. The war scenes. So, the idea <laughs> here seems to be, yeah, the war scenes combined with, like, yeah. the black ooze of the ocean. I think the, uh, he'll explain character will explain more about where it he thinks it came from this is cool but this looks a lot like oh, the it, it tar ran, pits it ran out of ambient sounds in which my boat lay grounded some distance away oh no the ambience restarted okay it's a restart. though one might well imagine that my first sensation would be of wonder at so prodigious and unexpected a transformation of scenery i was in reality more horrified than astonished yeah for there was in the air, and in the rotting soil, a sinister quality which chilled me to the very core. Yeah, the, the, the region was the rotting fish. The carcasses of decaying fish big part. and of other less describable things which I saw protruding from the nasty mud of the unending plain. Because even in Death Stranding, it was about dimension writing, and so was H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. So this is kind of really on the nose, eh? I don't Talking know why. Talking about dimensions and deities and. I, I don't know why wow. I never. Put, I don't know why I never put two and two together when we played that game. Like, oh my god. I don't. <laughs> like they even had squid monsters and shit in that game. We played that game like three times and we didn't Perhaps put that together. I should not hope to convey in mere words the unutterable hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence and barren immensity. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Hideousness that can dwell in absolute silence. Yeah. There was nothing so within deep. hearing and nothing in sight save a vast reach of black slime. Yet the very completeness of the stillness and the homogeneity of the landscape oppressed me with a nauseating fear. Yeah, there's like an endlessness. It just doesn't, it just goes on and on and on. The lens blur is a good it's, it, idea to create a dream. At effect. some point, I think they describe, he describes it as a desert. And, it actually, and I kind of found that the weird when reading it. The sun was blazing down from a sky which seemed to me almost black oh, wait, in its cloudless cruelty. As though reflecting the inky marsh beneath my feet. Okay. So I remember he mentioned it seeming like a desert. And I thought it was so weird to say that. And now I kind of looking at it, it looks like a desert now. Like a slimy, gl gl grime kind of desert. Polluted. Polluted, okay. yeah. What's that? Origins of Dagon. Oh yeah, so Dagon is a fish god, everybody. Okay, so it, Dagon seems to be inspired by Fish Head, a short novel by Irvin S. Cobb about unnatural affinities between a hybrid idiot and a strange fish of an isolated lake, supernatural horror in literature, H.P. Lovecraft. 
And Lovecraft's dream about a strange island emerging from the ocean. Yeah, I read, read about this. this. This actually was based on a dream he had. And him crawling in the ooze that covered its surface. Oh. Isn't that crazy? I dreamed that... I dreamed of that whole hideous crawl. I can yet feel the ooze sucking me down. Indifference of Dagon. Lovecraft's interest in the topic stemmed from his aversion to fish and sea smells in his own words. I have hated fish and feared the sea and everything connected with it since I was two years old. Dude, I get it. I'm right there with you. I feel like I'm like, I don't know about you guys out there, but I'm super fascinated by the ocean, but I'm also horrified by it. I don't want to be in it. Yeah, no. I, I, I find it really interesting. I agree. It's disgusting. Like, I remember, was it? No, it wasn't last summer. It was a couple summers ago. We watched... James showed me these documentaries about like deep ocean fish and yeah, cuttlefish. Have you, have you guys ever seen those where it's like, uh, uh, like um, I forget, it's like it's in like the Marianas trenches. It's like way, way, way deep, and yeah. you start to see like bioluminescence and all those really strange fish. Um, and there's a mysterious. There's there's an alien nation of that whole world. There's so so much unmysteriousness to what we don't know what's down there. We don't know anything about what's down there. So it's kind of cool how there's horror or writing inspired by that. It, it's such a it, for me it doesn't scare me so it's not like super scary horror but it's such an interesting idea especially for people who are terrified of the ocean like this is such an oh, interesting I, I'd be terrified. interesting fear kind of writing idea I, I don't know anything that's really quite like it I love H.P. Lovecraft, I guess, because I resonate with it so much, because it's like, because don't you kind of find when you, when you uh, read horror or you watch horror, it's like you facing your own demons? That's kind of why we enjoy yes, it. Yes, and people tend to, like, the, the either they're adverse to them, or if you're, like, into that kind of stuff, they're, the ones that you're either more adverse to, or, like, they appeal to you the most, are, like, the ones that get at your own fears. Yeah. So, for me, it's funny, like, I like H.P. Lovecraft, but I think a ground Poe kind of oh, a ground Poe man now we're talking about some really we're talking about some good writers tonight <laughs> this is nice some like the classics man the ones that got us to where we are before even Stephen King man yeah okay oh so yes yeah, so I, I cannot recall what earlier experience gave me such a profound and lasting aversion to the sea and seafood it's funny enough I like seafood uh, as well in darkness Lovecraft 1927 Donald Wandre I don't like the smell of seafood. I don't like the smell of fish. Fish, so are, I can get be that. Stinky. Oh god, I remember because I okay. Actually, yeah, well, let's keep it here while I talk. Um, I grew up by Lake Ontario when Lake Ontario was really polluted. So it's like you used oh, to yeah. you used to walk down the pier of Lake Ontario, and all you smelled was like polluted water and dead fish and like geese shit. It was awful. Like, it's disgusting. The ocean's not always a beautiful place. It's not always a beautiful place. It's not no. always a calm, settling place like it is on, on you know, your friggin' meditation app. It's can be yeah. disgusting and horrifying, too, y'all. I'm just, that's what I'm saying. It's got to get fucked up because we're just fucking up our oceans more and more and more every year. Yeah. Anyways, maybe there's a, something to say with this concept that H.P. Lovecraft's doing here. What to that? Anyways, let's keep going. Oh, uh, oh, oh, I did not need that in my life. Oh. That was As I crawled voice. into the stranded boat, I realized that only one theory could explain my position. Okay. And what theory Through is that? Some unprecedented volcanic upheaval, oh. a right. portion of the ocean floor must have been thrown to the surface. Yeah, that's the reason. Exposing regions for which innumerable millions of years had lain hidden under unfathomable watery depths. Dude, this connects so much to uh, Hartman and everything, and his science and everything. Yeah. Oh my lord, it's Death Stranding was so inspired by this story. It's not even funny. Absolutely. So great was the extent of the new land which had risen beneath me that I could not detect the faintest noise of the surging ocean, straining my ears as I might. Nor were there any sea fowl to prey upon the dead things. They're just dead. They're just there. Yeah, it's like the stuff was just thrown there. Yeah. Yep. For several hours, I sat thinking or brooding in the boat which lay upon its side and afforded a slight shade as the sun moved across the heavens. Uh, what's that? I don't know. It's moving. It's breathing. I don't like as it. As the day progressed, the ground lost some of its stickiness, 
and seemed likely to dry sufficiently for traveling purposes in a short time. Okay, but Muck is, like, coming close to you, so what's your plan, bro? That night I slept oh. but little, and the next day I made for myself a pack containing food and water, preparatory to an overland journey in search of the vanished uh, sea no, and go possible away. rescue. It, go away. Go away. Sir, nobody invited you to my barbecue, so can you please get off my this, girl? This is your idea of a barbecue? Girl, this is not <laughs> a barbecue. Oh, oh, the moon. Look at the moon on that. That's really cool. Oh, the stars. It's pretty. On the that is less pretty. Well, yeah. On the review for this game, there was someone that literally said, I would have flat out paid money for this. And I kind of agree, even though it's very simple. It brings you to the world I truly love. the third morning, I it found does. the soil dry enough to walk upon with ease. Okay. The odor of the fish was maddening, but I was too much concerned with graver things to mind so slight an evil, and set out boldly for an unknown goal. Okay. What is that? I guess it's more squid. It's a squid, yeah. Yeah, there's too many squid. Yeah. It's funny how they threw that a lot all over the place, even though that wasn't yeah. in the story specifically. All day, I forged steadily westward, guided by a faraway hummock which rose higher than any other elevation on yeah, the Yeah, the mountain. The mountain. What the hell are those? What are those claws? Yep, that's um. That's not good. That's, I yeah, that doesn't look good. That doesn't look good. A lot of this looks like it could kill me. That is not good. There's like these really creepy crabs in the ocean, guys. Have you ever heard of them called like spider crabs? And like they have these like I think they I think they have they have like these really long, long like legs and they look like, like spiders. Yeah. That night I encamped. It reminds me. And of on the following day, still traveled toward the hummock, though that object seemed scarcely nearer than when I had first espied it. So gross. I'm on a giant squid right now. Uh, the horrors of the ocean. The creator of the... Okay, how do you say this properly? Because I never say it right. Cthulhu or Cthulhu? Or, or, I've said Cthulhu, but Cthulhu. I was, oh, I was, we're going to say Cthulhu. I, I find... I don't know if you guys know which way is the right way, but I've heard so many different people say it differently, so I don't know. Yeah. The creator of the Cthulhu mythos in the fictional underwater city of Relay... Is that how you say that? Relay? 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 Was convinced that life could not exist at the bottom of the ocean because the water pressure would make it inhabitable. Today we know that the darkest depths of the oceans are home to many peculiar organisms. The deepest welling fish we have discovered so far in the, the, Mar the Mariana snailfish, in the Mariana's trench, it's crazy, can live about 8,000 meters more than 26,000 feet below the ocean surface in never-ending darkness and at hellishly crushing pressures, hundreds of times stronger than those found at sea level. Upon glancing at the modern photos of deep sea creatures such as the angular fish, they're creepy. You guys have probably seen these. If you remember Nemo, you remember the little light flicking fish that tried to eat uh, Nemo's dad? That's what an angular fish is. Oh, okay. They yeah. have like the big jaw and they and they use bioluminescence to try to lure prey in. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's the angler fish. There's a lot of different types nightmares. of Nightmares. They're nightmares, man. The fang tooth with the viper fish. Oh yeah. And they're truly Lovecraftian characteristics. It's hard not to find some irony. I'll put pictures of these fish up there just so you guys can get a in the mood here. <laughs> Alright. So that's what we're seeing right now. <laughs> The ocean's scary, man. By the fourth Ooh. evening, I attained the base of the mound, which turned out to be much higher than it had appeared from a distance. What is this, right? Like, you go, so you're searching around, right? Looking around for anything. Anything you can grasp here. Yeah. There's a random mountain of shit. An intervening valley setting it out in sharper relief from the general surface. <coughs> okay. Too weary to ascend. I slept in the shadow of the hill. 
How's your food supply, man? I'd be concerned about I that. I know not oh. why my dreams were so wild that night. This is once... Oh, this is a dream. The sounds. But ere the waning and fantastically gibbous moon had risen far above the eastern plain. The scratching kind of sound sense. Ooh. I was awake in a cold perspiration, determined to sleep no more. You can't sleep anymore. He's too crazy. Such visions as I had experienced were too much for me to endure again. Wow. And in the glow of the moon, I saw how unwise I had been to travel by day. Without the glare of the parching sun, my journey would have cost me less energy. That's a good point. Indeed, I now felt quite able to perform the ascent which had deterred me at sunset. Okay. It's gonna be really slippery Picking though, up my isn't pack, it? I started for the crest of the eminence. Okay. Okay. Yep, here we go. I have said that the unbroken monotony of the rolling plane was a source of vague horror to me. But I think my horror was greater when I gained the summit of the mound and looked down the other side into an immeasurable pit or canyon. What is this? whose black recesses the moon had not yet soared high enough to illumine. I felt myself on the edge of the world. Oh, that's a cool idea. And you remember that in the Pirates of the Caribbean? The edge of the world? The yeah. flat thing? Peering over the rim into a fathomless chaos of eternal night. Ew. Through my terror ran curious reminiscences of Paradise Lost. <laughs> it's also a good book that I have to read. Oh, good luck. One of Peyton's favorite books. I had to study that book extensively in university. Yeah. Um, so I have a love-hate relationship with it. I remember being at, like, because I, I, I did my major in music, but I did a minor in English literature. Mm -hmm. And so I had to write this paper on it. And, like, every time we had a rehearsal and, like, I wasn't expected to play, I just had Paradise Lost out, like, putting notes in it like yeah and have seen this book hideous in. climb yes. through the unfashioned realms of darkness so i know this this illusion very well as the moon climbed higher in the sky i began to see that the slopes of the valley were not quite so perpendicular as i had imagined Ledges and outcroppings yep. of rock afforded fairly easy footholds for a descent. Okay. Whilst after a drop of only a few hundred feet, the declivity became very gradual. So you're gonna walk down. Here we go. Oh, the sounds are changing. Urged on by an impulse which I cannot definitely analyze, Ooh. I scrambled with difficulty down the rocks and stood on the gentler slope beneath, gazing into the Stygian deeps where no light had yet penetrated. Yeah, that's really dark. Yep. All at once, my attention was captured by a vast and singular object on the opposite slope, which rose steeply about a hundred yards ahead of me. An object that gleamed whitely in the newly bestowed rays of the ascending moon. Interesting, interesting. This is just so freaking pretty, the moon, every yeah, time is they're, gorgeous. They're, the sky is just like, mm, chef's kiss. They got at what they said they would, eh? it was yeah. merely a Maybe gigantic a piece of stone, I soon assured myself. But I was conscious of a distinct impression that its contour and position were not altogether the work of nature. A closer scrutiny filled me with sensations I cannot express. Ooh, the sounds. I love their imagining of this area. It's kind of cool. Just this is really cool. Just the but emptiness of it. Despite its enormous magnitude. Yeah and its position in an abyss which had yawned at the bottom of the sea since the world was young. I perceived beyond a doubt that the strange object was a well-shaped monolith. Yep. Whose massive bulk had known the workmanship and perhaps the worship 
of living and thinking creatures. This is made by something. Or Dazed someone. and frightened. Yeah. Yet not without a certain thrill of the scientists or yeah, archaeologists' I love that. delight. Yeah. I examined my surroundings more closely. I love okay, I love the uh the perspective of the scientists in horror. It's so fascinating. The scientists yeah. trying to understand something that's supernatural, but they can't. I think it's such a cool idea for storytelling. I love when they do that. HP Lovecraft does do that a lot. It's really cool. Um Oh my god, I always talk about this, but I, I think one of the coolest scenes to me is um, if you haven't watched Haunting on Hill House, I mean, like, my god, where have you been? Who raised, who raised <laughs> wow. you in you that told, cave? You got, you got told. Um, but there's a there's a scene in it, it's not spoilers, it, it's just a general talk, where um, the one son, right, Stephen, he's like, um, uh, what are those people? Like, he, he writes books about people who have encounters with the supernatural, and so he's setting up all this equipment. Uh, and he, and uh, he's in this woman's house who apparently has seen her dead husband. And he uh, kind of, he you know, he's talking to her about, she uses the word supernatural. And he's like, well, no, it's it's not supernatural. It's just we as a species treat things as being supernatural or like mythical. Um, but we it, can't explain it any other way. We can't explain it any other way. Yeah. And so there is like almost like a science or like a paranatural kind of idea. That's what he called it. He called it paranatural. Something yeah. that hasn't been defined yet. Yes. There's a supernatural, something that doesn't exist, I guess. It's weird. It's a weird yeah. idea. But yeah, I, I just love it. It's, it reminds me of like even Nightmare Before Christmas with Chuck Skellington. Mm -hmm. he, him, the idea of him trying to understand through the science inquiry method of you know, what another holiday or another world is, which is, and it's something that he's got all these tools and equipment to try to understand it, but he doesn't have the right tools or frame of mind to understand what it is. I love when, when they bring sci the scientist inquiry to understanding like supernatural, but anyways, keep going. This is getting interesting. I like that. The scientists or archeologist um, enthusiasm. Come on, let's rock it. Oh, okay. I thought they might have an explanation on the monolith. Yeah. Ooh, look the one. Now near the zenith, shone weirdly and vividly above the towering steeps that hemmed in the chasm. Oh, you can do, look, you can see stuff in the monolith now. Yep. Ooh. And revealed the fact that a far-flung body of water flowed at the bottom, winding out of sight in both directions, and almost lapping my feet as I stood on the slope. Like a beach. Yep. Across the chasm, the wavelets washed the base of the cyclopean monolith on whose surface I could now trace both inscriptions and crude sculptures. Yep. Yeah, you can kind of see them. Well, let's go touch thing. The writing was in a system of hieroglyphics unknown Ooh. to me and unlike really anything cool. I'd ever seen in books. It's weird at bottom. <laughs> consisting for the most part of conventionalized aquatic symbols such as fishes, eels, octopi, crustaceans, mollusks, whales, and the like. Several characters obviously represented marine things which are unknown to the modern world. Oh yeah, at the bottom. Ooh. But whose decomposing forms I had observed on the ocean-risen plain. It was the pictorial carving, however, that did most to hold me spellbound. Oh, question mark. What's that? Storytelling methods. Dagon contains many themes and storytelling methods that Lovecraft developed in his later works, such as telling the story through carvings at the okay. Mountains of Madness, the nameless city, as an example. Journals and character uh, notes. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. this is a uh, this is a uh, essentially what they've considered a suicide yeah, note. Suicide, no, a, suicide a, note. A, a diary. Yeah, right. yeah, you're right. So this this is a suicide okay, note. Okay. Yeah. Islands emerging from the ocean. The color. Yep, that like happened. Cthulhu. Right. Like they said, the the volcanic kind of. Yep. Or fictional beings <laughs> and uh, deities based on real events and mytholo mythologies. Migo and the Whisper and Darkness. Uh, so fictional being, so the, he's using um, an actual real mythological fish god 
so um, which you'll see more about as we go forward here. It's also considered the origin of the pop the yeah, Cthulhu mythos. Some of Lovecraft's other stories also conclude in a manner similar to Dagon. But let's get the details in order not to spoil the ending. So, I love that they're still respecting the story. It's no, they they are they are respecting the this story. Like it's great, and I think it's story. I think it's important to point out though that this is the earliest work in the Cthulhu mythos, right? Like this. Yeah, is this is one of his earliest stories. Like so, he yeah. uh, so I think the idea was he wrote for a pulp magazine, um, I think, um, with uh, called the Weird Tales or something, and this was Weird published Tales, yeah. in the Weird Tales. I think I I don't know if I got that exactly right, but. It's something called the Weird Tales. All right, this is cool. Plainly visible across oh, the intervening water on account of their enormous size were an array of bas reliefs whose subjects would have excited the envy of a Doré. I think that these things were supposed to depict men, yeah. at least a certain sort of men. This makes me think of the, the Ismouthers. shown disporting yes. like fishes in the waters of some or sirens. Grotto. Oh, sirens, yep. Yeah. Or paying homage at some monolithic shrine, which appeared to be or under the for waves Zelda. as well. Zoros. Zoros. Well, that's probably what the Zoros faces were inspired by. Forms I dare not speak in detail. For the mere remembrance makes me grow faint. Grotesque beyond the imagination of a Poe or a Bulwer. Uh, what, what does he mean by imagination of a Poe? What does he mean by that? Like Edgar Allan Poe, like the imagination of Edgar Allan Poe. Because he was super influenced by Poe. Look at look at these carvings, guys. Holy shit. One looks like a weird rat person. That one reminds me of Layers of Fear, the rat lady. Oh, yeah, I don't like that. Right? The Ugh. one at the top does look like the Innsmouthers from Sinking City. So, I don't know much about the stories about the Innsmouthers in the actual HP uh, Lovecraft stories. But in Sinking City, they are literally these fish people walking around. They have, like, fish heads. Or they have a, a face that's deformed, looks sort of like a fish. It's very interesting. A game, by the way, it's 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 fighting mechanics are terrible. It's very glitchy. The game's very glitchy, but it's it's worth it, man. If you it's like so storytelling, good. if you like this, you gotta play that. Okay, let's keep going. I wanna keep going. All right. They were damnably human in general outline, despite webbed hands and feet, shockingly wide and flabby lips. Yeah. Glassy, bulging eyes and other features less pleasant to recall. Like weird rat eyes? Curiously enough, they seem to have been chiseled badly out of proportion with their scenic background. For one of the creatures was shown in the act of killing a whale, represented as but little larger than himself. Oh, yeah, that's big. That's a humpback whale too, so that's a, or I something remarked, like one, so that's as big. I say, their grotesqueness and strange size Okay. But in a moment, decided that they were merely the imaginary gods of some primitive fishing or seafaring. And now it makes sense. And now it makes sense. Fish to an archaeologist or a scientist, yeah. that kind of perspective. Some tribe whose last descendant had perished eras before the first ancestor of the Piltdown or Neanderthal man was born. Awestruck at this unexpected glimpse into a past beyond the conception of the most daring anthropologist. I stood musing whilst the moon cast queer reflections on the silent channel before me. This is horrifying. Yep, that's pretty horrifying. Then, suddenly, I saw it. What? Where is it? Where is it? With only a slight churning to mark its rise to uh, the surface, uh, the oh, thing uh, slid uh, into view above the dark waters. Uh, I forgot it came out of the water. Oh God, Jesus, God, God, damn it! Darted like a stupendous monster of nightmares to the marlin, about which it flung its gigantic screams, while it bowed its hideous head and gave vent to certain measured sounds. We're losing our. I think I went mad then. Yeah, same, because I just like blah, blah, add it back. Uh. Of my frantic ascent of the slope and cliff, and of my delirious journey back to the stranded boat, I remember little. He's like hallucinating and shit now. I believe I 
I sang a great deal and laughed oddly when I was unable to sing. I'm creeped out, guys. I, I would totally jump scared by that. I never read this story already. <laughs> Something is definitely very wrong. When I came out of the shadows, I was in the San Francisco hospital. Not being the San Francisco. Brought thither by the captain of the American ship which had picked up my boat in mid-ocean. In my delirium, I had said much, but found that my words had been given scant attention. What does scant mean? Like bad attention? Uh, no attention. Very little attention. Gotcha. Of any land upheaval in the Pacific, my rescuers knew nothing. She was like vampire now. Nor did I deem yeah. it necessary to insist upon a thing which I knew they could not believe. The game, I mean, guys. Sorry. What's that? The journalist. Lovecraft was a prominent figure in the world of amateur journalism. Oh cool, I didn't know that. In 1915, he started publishing his own journal called The Conservative, which included political and social commentary, poetry, short stories, and literary criticism written by him and other authors. Howard was a skilled wordsmith, but he also took criticisms to heart, which resulted in his decision to step away from writing poetry and concentrate on weird fiction again. Yeah, look that up. Weird fiction is actually a thing. It sounds weird that there's a genre of writing called that, but it's a thing. It's well known to be a thing. Hmm. Did you know okay. about that? No. I didn't dig much into it, but I ran into that, that word before. It's funny how they brought that up. Interesting. For the first time since his teenage years, Dagon published in 1917 is one of the short stories written during that period. In this example, excerpt from The Conservative, the master of horror fiction explains his attitude towards warfare and the idea of world peace. Okay. Why any sane human being can believe in the possibility of universal peace is more than the conservative can fathom. Should the entire civilized wor world agree simultaneously to disarm? One or more nations would undoubtedly retain secret armament what does it say? Armaments? Armaments, yeah. What does that mean? Like, uh, military weapons and resources. Okay, yeah. And at the proper time, take advantage of their more altruistic and less astute contemporaries in a wild career of conquest against unarmed victims. No country is or ever can be above warfare until the basic impulses of the human animal shall, be a, shall have miraculously changed. Interesting point. That's a stance. Yeah. That's a, that's quite a stance. So he's saying that war is a hundred percent an inevitability. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. What do you think? <sighs> that's a, gonna be that yeah, asshole. No. What why why the hell think? are we playing this game? If we're not gonna talk about this shit. Yeah. I. <sighs> war should always be the last thing we do. Yeah. Don't you think? If, I, if everything else fails and we have no choice, then we go to war. But then again, like, you know, that's like the idea of like, oh, someone takes advantage of that. You know, another country takes advantage of that or another group takes advantage of that. But I think he has a point in the sense of it is inevitable because violence is inherently like human. Human. Right? Yeah. We are violent we, creatures. We are violent creatures by Sadly. natures. By natures. <laughs> by natures. Wow, I sounded so intelligent up until that moment. Um, but no, it's true. Like, we we really... I think... I, I, I hate to be this person. God. I, I think you're just going to make your stance, man. Yeah. There's, no, there's no easy... There's no, no polite there's no way e around there's this. There's no easy way to say this. There's um, no polite way around this. I think ultimately, yeah, he's correct. And I, I think just at the end of it, we, we can't trust everybody to be um, peace-loving and altruistic anymore. 
I, I just, it's not realistic. It never has been. Um, like the world peace kind of Miss America speech. Like, I think the idea is that's what it is. The, the approach <laughs> I, the approach I would come and take from this is we must understand that he, he is right. War is always going to be there somewhere. Yeah. And that being said, we want to lead each other to being to, to kind of problem solving together in the most peaceful way possible to better the world's quality of life. That should always be the goal. But again, everyone's quality of life is very different. So uh, communication skills, negotiations, all those things need to be pushed forward as much as possible first. It should always yeah. be a skill set that no one should ever ignore or ever put down as not important. You know, picking up a gun before that should never, ever be the way. I think the you problem know? now, though, is we've... I know that politics make it much more yeah. complicated than that, but I think that... We like, just live in such a big world, man. Like It's not that easy. Yeah. How can you keep you know, order essentially across the board of 18, like, or sorry, 8 billion people. You know what I mean? Like, it just doesn't happen. And what's sad, I think, now is we've gotten so to the point, like, during COVID where it really brought it out. Like, we're so individualized and we're so, you know, politicians well, are very... Well, in this part of the... It, in, in this part of the in, world. In North America. Are very um, swayed. I guess, by certain decisions that are more profitable versus just doing the right thing. We don't really have the, 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 yeah, it's just always, if people keep making selfish choices and focusing on themselves, what can we expect, right? Like it's. Yep. No, it's it. There's no easy answer here. There's not going no. to be, there's no easy answer. Cause it's just, it's so easy for me to say those things too when there's all these other uh, underlying issues of people manipulating systems and control and government. Oh my God, there's so many problems. But like, I think, I don't know, I, I think optimistically, I like to believe that we have ways of moving past it. I think there'll be times, yeah, where there will be war again. There's no way around that, but I don't want to focus on it. You know what I mean? I don't want to fixate on it. Well, yeah, you don't want to, like, I'm why- I'm glad that he pointed that out. Why well, sweat the point. petty things, but like, yeah, there's. It's no, just it's it, it's an interesting thing to talk with about with the amount of people we have on this planet. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. No. Once I sought out a celebrated ethnologist and amused him with peculiar questions regarding the ancient Philistine legend of Dagon, the fish god. Yep. He's a fish god. There we go. Here we go. Dagon was the main deity of the Philistines, worshipped uh, of the Philistines, worshipped throughout the Middle East as the ancient god of fertility and crops. In Hebrew, the word Dagon was a common noun for grain. Oh. Oh, okay. The rulers of Akkad, Mesopotamia, uh, chose him as the patron saint of their war conquests. He also appeared as the judge of the dead in the Assyrian poem and the underworld prison warder in one of the Babylonian texts. He is often mistakenly taken for a fish god due, oh, due to the wrong interpretation of his name, as in Hebrew the word dag means fish. Fish and god. Just, so okay, this was a yep. misinterpretation by H.P. Lovecraft. Um, H.P. Lovecraft's work, Dagon is an underwater deity ruling over the deep ones. A humanoid race with fish traits that resides in the oceans. He's worshipped by a secret cult called the Esoteric Order of Dagon. Cool. That's interesting to know. So that was that's like a weird uh, history blip, eh? Yeah. That's interesting. You never know, though, right? Like he just. Oh, mistranslations exist everywhere. Yeah. Like especially in ancient texts, right? Yep. Cool. Oh, something on the right there? Oh, yep, yeah, you were correct. Oh, that's where we go next. The window. No? But soon perceiving that he was hopelessly conventional, I did not press my inquiries. <laughs> he was hopefully, hopelessly conventional. That's interesting. I like that. August uh, Derleth and the Cthulhu Mythos. August Derleth was an American writer and anthologist. He also befriended Lovecraft and published many of his works throughout his company, Arkham House. <laughs> this is just too perfect. 
Wait, hold on here. Okay, by the <laughs> way, we do know that Arkham Asylum from Batman. I'm sure you guys have heard us talk about Batman a lot. Sorry. We, we do know that they got Arkham Asylum from H.P. Lovecraft. Yeah. But what do they mean by Arkham House, though, exactly? Uh, I'm guessing there was a publishing house. Arkham House. Weird. Although he greatly contributed to the popularization of the author's works after his death. Oh. He surrounded... He is surrounded by numerous controversies. Okay. One of his most questionable decisions involved introducing the good versus evil doctrine. Derelith was a devout Catholic uh. to the Cthulhu Mathis. Okay. Which can contrast with love perhaps a view of the world his approach to the cosmic horror. As a result, the author's works are often misunderstood and misrepresented in today's culture. Interesting. That isn't... I'm not uh, surprised by that. People throw up things around all the time and... Like, this guy, didn't he die, like, in the 30s or something? Yeah. Yeah, he, like, died, like, 1937 or something. Something like that, yeah. So, it's it's almost been 100 years since then, guys. Almost. It's also worth noting that Lovecraft was never really um, interested in creating a mythology. The term Cthulhu Mythos was coined by Derelith after the author left. Uh, Ah, so that was done after his death. Interesting. Huh. Interesting. Ooh, what's happening? Glitch. Oops. Oh, another glitch. One sec. The desk, maybe? Oh, the there clock. There we go. <laughs> Set the slower down. Clock. We're going to clock. Sound design is really cool. I like it. Music and stuff. Okay. Nothing on the clock? Nope. Okay. Interesting. I don't know. No? Okay. Weird. It is at night, especially when the moon is gibbous and waning, that I see the thing. Uh oh. Okay. I tried morphine. Mm, yeah, we know, my dude. But the drug has given only transient surcease and has drawn me into its clutches as a hopeless slave. That was very common, though. So yeah. now, I am to end it all, having written a full account for the information or the contemptuous amusement of my fellow men. Oh, does he drink that? to take our drinks. Often, I ask myself if it could not all have been a pure phantasm. A mere freak of fever as I lay sun-stricken and raving in the open boat after my escape from the German man of war. Yeah, I wondered about that, whoa. This I ask myself, but ever does there come before me a hideously vivid vision in reply. You're gonna show the thing. I cannot think of the deep sea without shuddering oh. at the nameless things whoa. that may at this very moment be crawling and floundering on its slimy bed. Worshipping their ancient stone idols, uh, carving their own uh, detestable likenesses on submarine obelisks of water soaked uh, granite. No. It reminds me of that castaway scene when he's like lying on the thing and then the whale comes. I dream of a day when That's they horrifying. may rise above the billows to drag down into their reeking talons the remnants of puny, war exhausted mankind. It's of a day Good time. when the land shall sink. And the dark ocean shall ascend amidst universal pandemonium. Yeah, he mentioned that this was like a war against humans, not just him. It wasn't just a personal thing. He said this is like a yeah, like, like almost like it almost feels like war, war of the worlds, but from the ocean. I mean, it's not far off. <laughs> End is near. No. I hear a noise at the, the door, door. The door. The door. As of some the door. Immense slippery body lumbering against it. Uh, okay. No. 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 Oh. 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 So we can it. just do this. It shall let's go. not find me. I don't like throbbing things. I also 
also decided this. Do you hear the weird eerie like vocal vocalist thing? Uh, no. No. God, that hand. There's a hand. The window! The window! You did not end well. <laughs> there it is, guys. Wow. Uh, so now you can say you know an HP Lovecraft story. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? Really cool depiction of it. Really Holy cool. Cow, that's so cool. Thank you for playing. We hope you've enjoyed immersing yourself in our little pool of cosmic horror. Oh, guys, we we loved it. This is, this should not have been free. I know it wasn't uh, a game where you were doing a lot of different things and making choices like that, but. It was just like telling a good ghost story or a good, just a good little horror story and, and really just immersing you into it. It was really cool. Try this game. It's it fun. is free on Steam. It is it's fun. It's free. Absolutely free. And they have DLC, guys. Yeah. Now, the DLC I've learned that, that you can pay for because they've been having a lot of success, these guys. I just randomly found this on on uh, Steam and I was like, I could just be Lovecraft. What's this? What yeah. This? <laughs> and then I downloaded it. It's free, whatever. And then Payne was like, yo, yeah, we should, we should, uh, play, we should play this on Halloween. And we're like, cool, yeah. So yeah, fuck yeah. It's not Halloween, obviously, but gotta get the spook mood going on, right? Um, but yeah, like I, I love the immersion, that the sound effects, that you know, bringing you into it. I, I thought I was wondering if we were gonna be a little bored because we read the book already, but it just brought you into. I, it brought me right in the story the whole time. I was just the dread. I got jump scared. <laughs> I got freaking jump scared, man. I just love how it went, oh. <laughs> I had to do it back. It's my defense. The monster, it was supposed to be like Cyclopsy or something with like scaly arms. So it was, that's what it was supposed to be, right? Yeah, Cyclopsy with scaly arms. Do you think that was supposed to be Dagon? I th is, okay, so is that Dagon or like they showed like a bunch, like they talk about a bunch of different people, creature things. Yeah, that was on the uh, the stone and everything. The monolith, yeah. So could it even just be like the common Zora? Like <laughs> exactly, this is the common Zora is Dagon. <laughs> Luna's here. Hey, Luna. Everybody say hi to Luna. Hey, say hi. She says happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching. Remember to subscribe to keep up with what we're doing, and we'll see you in the next spooky little video. Bye bye, guys. Oh, say bye bye. Say bye bye. bye, -bye. She's like, no way. Bye -bye. <laughs> She's confused.